OpenAI unveiling its highly anticipated GPT-5, calling it the smartest, fastest, and most advanced AI model to date. The model, powering new capabilities in writing, coding, healthcare, all chat GPT users have access, including non-paying users, if you're using it for free, OpenAI rocketing into the mainstream since its launch back in 2022. Now, expectations have it hitting 700 million weekly active users this week. Join me now is the man behind it all, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman joins me right now. Sam, great to have you. Congratulations to you. Thank you very much for having me. And you, you say G GPT-5 is like having a team of PhD-level experts on demand. Tell us about that. How does this deeper reasoning change what users and businesses can do with AI? Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, we're, we're very proud of this model. It's a really big step forward from our previous models. The, the level of intelligence, the depth in all the areas from coding to healthcare to the ability for enterprises to build agents, um, and much, much more. It's, it's a pretty significant step forward. So people are able to ask very complicated questions, have uh, GPT-5 do complicated things for them, write an entire piece of software, um, get you know information about a complicated health situation, and, and a lot more. Sam, how do you use AI? Tell us what you do on a regular basis in terms of using AI. It has become, for me, the default way I start with something. Um, if I have a question, it's the first place I go to ask. If I want to, with GPT-5, if I have, like, an idea that I want to see sketched out, um, the the fact that it can now just, like, write this piece of, of software um, and, and show me that right away is, like, it feels quite magical, even though I'm, I'm pretty used to AI. Um, I use it to, like, help analyze, like, a big piece of, uh, like, a ton of information. Um, or research a complicated topic. Uh, so those are some of the ways. I, I know that a OpenAI released two new AI models designed to be lower cost options for developers and researchers and companies. Talk about that. What's the strategic thinking behind moving into open weight space? What does it mean for the broader landscape for AI? Yeah, so we had two big releases this week. We did open weight models, uh, models that you can run that we open source the, the the key information for, and you can run locally on your own computer or a GPU or even a phone at a smaller, kind of less capable model. And then we also released in our API three versions of GPT-5, um, like a kind of a big, medium, and a small one at different price points. But we we worked really hard with both of these models to have an extremely both of these families of models an extremely low cost relative to the performance. Um, we've been doing great at consumer for a while, but now that we are really kind of becoming um, a, a model that's so used by enterprise, uh, the ability to bring the cost down a lot and the re reliability, robustness, um, the coding capability in particular up a lot uh, is, is very important to us. So the, the models at each of these level, at each of these capability points, uh, I think are like by far the best deal in the whole market now. I, I love the idea of uh, the impact of the co on cost because, of course, that's what enterprise is looking for, a, a, a situation where they can actually cut costs. And I was speaking with the CEO of one telecom company recently, and he told me that AI has enabled his engineers at his telecom company to become 28 percent more productive. So, Sam, what is your expectation in terms of that? Cutting costs for enterprise, making people more um, productive, obviously saying, look, we don't need that many people. How will this shake out in terms of jobs? Where will new jobs be created? What are the new roles? And how significant will it be in terms of uh, cutting, cutting employees and, and getting more productive as a result of this technology? Yeah. Look, I think the productivity gains we're seeing already before GPT-5 are were big. And what we're hearing people report just in the first day of having GPT-5 um, are huge. So maybe the area where we see this most dramatically is software engineering. And you hear people say they're twice as productive, five times as productive, these huge, huge numbers. It's totally changing what it means to be a software engineer. In that category, though, I think we're just seeing that the world wants way more software created. And so people will be expected to do much more. They'll be able to do much more. But the world will just get a lot more software. There will be other categories of jobs where the world will just say, like, hey, with this with this incredible efficiency gain, we just don't need as many people. 
Um, and then there will be totally new things that just didn't, they weren't even possible to think about before AI. And you'll see this, you know, these booms and these brand new kinds of jobs categories. Um, and those are, those are the hardest to imagine, I think. And, and of course, that's the reason that ChatGPT's use in workplaces is surging across industries, right? I mean, you've got so many industries now incorporating it in their business plans and ensuring that employees know how to use it and, and are using it regularly. What's your sense of how much companies are spending on this technology? Um, what? The Wall Street Journal reported a couple of months ago, or a couple of weeks ago, rather, that big tech is going to spend $400 billion in an AI spending spree. And they were really talking about Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta spending. But are you seeing spending broadly across business, or is it still concentrated in those tech companies, Sam? So th th that number you talked about, I think, is just what the tech companies are spending on the AI infrastructure, the servers, the computer chips, to be able to create these products. In terms of businesses actually spending on the technology, you know, I didn't think this a couple of years ago. We were just, the numbers were so much smaller and we were still very much in the consumer phase. I think a company like OpenAI will be able to build a $100 billion business line just selling products to other businesses. The, the efficiency gains... The value delivered is so worth it that I think I think we can now build a huge business here, and we're uh, excited to get going on that. Because companies are going to spend on the actual open AI content, not just on the infrastructure that we you just referred to, yeah, that infrastructure being chips and servers and data centers. The services that we build on top of that, I think, are now just generating so much economic value. That's incredible. We, we hear from... We hear from yeah, we hear from companies like Amgen, who was an early tester of GPT-5, just saying that this, this is really a step change for the value it can deliver and how it helps them do that. Uh, we, financial services companies uh, really do, you know, have, have been early adopters that are now pushing even further. But the amount of automation that's possible, the amount of new, completely new products that someone can just build, um, it's quite significant. So, Sam, what are those products that you are envisioning that you can layer on top of this to, to create this business that you're talking about? Give us a sense of some of those products that you're referring to. I would, I would love to have, I would love to be able to build sort of a general purpose service for a business where a worker can say, okay, here's the, here are the five tasks I do most often on my computer and show them to the AI and sort of teach the AI, like here's, you know, here's what I need help with, here's the part I'd like you to automate. And the AI can learn for that worker, the parts of the task that they need help with that are repetitive that they can automate, and then just learn to do those and say, hey, I, you know, I think this is what I should probably do here. Click OK to confirm, I can go make it happen. And the amount of, and if we can do that in a general purpose way, you know, from jobs that are as diverse as like data entry to computer programming to uh, scientific experiments, um, then I think we can give people huge additional leverage to, to work at a higher level. Now, you just mentioned a couple of industries. You mentioned healthcare, you mentioned financial services. So, Sam, tell us what specifically can get done in healthcare companies and in financial services with the use of this latest GPT uh, 5. Yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll pick healthcare as an example because that's uh, that's an area that's very important to us. It's a huge amount of the use of ChatGPT, and so we pushed it very hard with uh, GPT-5 to improve it at healthcare. Um, if you ask GPT-5 healthcare questions, you will you will notice a huge increase in um, its capability from GPT-4. And we've heard from many healthcare companies that are like, I can now build um, a completely different product than I could before, maybe to help my physicians make a complicated diagnosis by looking at information and knowing things that they might have otherwise, you know, a disease that might be so rare, so presented in such an unusual way. So you can imagine like a physician assistant that, that a company could build with GPT-5 um, that would really potentially save a lot of lives. And what about financial services, Sam? Financial services are, have, have, as I mentioned, I think that was the first category where we had like significant enterprise adoption. Um, and we have seen this from, uh, you know, financial advisors that want to make better recommendations to their clients about asset allocation and like the ability to look at and really understand a customer's needs. Um, we've seen this from 
people that do research on financial assets in totally different ways using the ability of uh, now GPT-5 and earlier GPT-4 to go integrate a ton of information and really help study a company. Um, certainly to just build software faster, uh, do things like customer support faster is something that financial services companies have been early adopters of. That's incredible. Now, I know that lots of rivals of yours are trying to escalate uh, this talent war. Everybody's offering massive pay packages to poach top AI researchers, Sam. Where do you find AI researchers and the employees that you need to put in these jobs to actually execute? Um, a lot of the best success we've had is finding really smart people from other fields and training them over years to become great AI researchers. Um, so we, we've had just phenomenal success finding the smartest people we can and then having them come to our company and learn how to be great AI researchers. And I expect they'll keep doing that. And are you offering bonuses to those people of up to one and a half million dollars to keep staff on board? We, yeah, look, we're, we're definitely, uh, we, we want to pay our people super well and we want to react to what's happening in the market. We, we will not be able to sort of do match the levels of some companies like say what Meta's doing, um, but we will continue to try to significantly increase our compensation as our company does better and better. So what's the salary of an average AI engineer? Um, well, it mostly, I mean, they're mostly paid in stock and, you know, our stock has been doing really well. Yeah. So I, I don't know quite how to answer that, uh, but yeah, the, the, the great, great majority of the compensation we give to an AI researcher is in stock. And are you now talking to employees about a stock sale that actually could have some employees cash out? I mean, the valuation being talked about, what, is $500 billion for OpenAI? We do a, a liquidity event every year. Uh, we're, we're a private company, and so we have to have some way to get our employees uh, the liquidity on their stock before we go public, if, if we ever do. So, yeah, we, we do one every year. And the liquidity event, to to tell me about the liquidity event. I mean, are you hoping that you could get some employees to take that liquidity event cash out at a $500 billion valuation? Um, I can't comment on the specific valuation, but but yeah, like people are able to sell a you know a portion of their stock uh, every year in, in our. So this is like a very standard thing for companies of our stage, and we've been doing it. I don't know, last three or four years. I mean, Sam, isn't that incredible? Do you pinch yourself every day? I mean, look at look at this company you founded, that is now being valued at five hundred billion dollars. How do you feel about that, Sam? Um. When I was a kid, I, I dreamed of getting to work on AI. I, I was like a sci-fi nerd. I thought AI was the coolest thing. I grew up in like a suburb of St. Louis. It felt like a very unlikely thing that was ever going to happen to me. Um, so yeah, I can't believe that this is actually what I get to do every day. Uh, and <laughs> it is the coolest thing I can get to work on. I feel super grateful. That is incredible. I'm sure you are super grateful. Sam, I want to take a quick break, and then I want to get your usages for uh, the new uh, GPT-5. And I want to get you to talk to us a little about what's possible for our audience. Stay right there. We've got more with Sam Altman on the other side of this break. Back in a minute.